Hello, you are listening to Germantown Community Radio, WRGU 92.9 FM. Welcome to the Jumpstart Philly Real Estate Radio Show, a weekly radio program that spotlights positive real estate development and neighborhood revitalization throughout Philadelphia. I'm your host, Derek Hengemill. Jumpstart Philly is a unique community development program that trains, mentors, networks, and provides funding to aspiring real estate developers in seven different Philadelphia neighborhoods, including Germantown, where the program was founded. Jumpstart believes that you can do well by doing good and focuses on removing neighborhood blight, scattered site rehab, creating a healthy mix of affordable and market rate housing, and avoiding gentrification through slow, steady growth and keeping wealth local. Interviews are conducted during Jumpstart Germantown's weekly Jumpinar series on Monday nights at 7 p.m., held via Zoom webinar. For more information about these events, you can check out the events page at jumpstartgermantown.com. This week, I'll be speaking with John Thane, who is a Jumpstart Germantown mentor and experienced real estate developer going on 40 years, about alternative financing strategies for your projects and the option of owner-seller financing. I hope you enjoyed the conversation, and be sure to check out the podcast version of this program at jumpstartgermantown.com slash media. So, so let's jump right into it, and I'll start by introducing our guest, John Thane. And John Thane is the president of Global Marketing and is a consultant of, excuse me, is a consultant responsible for brand building and brand extensions. John's background consists of 25 years of product development production planning, international sourcing, and sales marketing solutions with expertise in private label and brand development. Additionally, John is manager is a managing member of Cool Holdings and has built one of the largest Rita's Italian Ice franchise groups, serving Rita's Italian Ice in as many as seven stores, plus the Dell and Mann Music Centers. While building Cool Holdings, John has developed three commercial properties that house Rita's franchises. And over the many years, John has developed over 30 residential and commercial properties and currently serves as a mentor in the Jumpstart Germantown program. And since 2019, John is a contributing member of the Summit Club podcast, which is a business podcast magazine featuring relevant business topics and customized podcasts for targeted corporate communication of information. So when you're not listening to our podcast, you can head over to, uh, to John's and check that out for some other great content. Um, so, so let's just start by uh, maybe, John, you can tell us what your topic's going to be tonight and, and introduce yourself to everybody in the call. Absolutely. And thanks for that wonderful introduction. I'm, 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 it seems like I've done a lot. Actually, I think it really reflects on the fact that I'm just really old. <laughs> so <laughs> I've been around for a long time. <laughs> uh, but, it, you, know, it take, you know, this concept and, you know, when I was approached by Jumpstart, and asked for a concept that I would, I would like to speak on, it was alternative financing because alternative financing allowed me to really get into the business of real estate ownership and development at a very young age, 21, but it allowed me to uh, build a portfolio probably before I had the really financial strength to, to make some of the transactions that I made early in my career. Um, but let, let's just take a second and, and look, there's a number of different alternative uh, financing uh, methods out there. Uh, if you don't want to go to a bank, there's always the old friends and family, you know, and so many people do that. Uh, it's worked for many people and it also can provide, or, you know, uh, cause some difficulties, you know, sometimes doing business with friends and family isn't as easy as it should be. And usually it's not as structured as it should be. Consequently, someone always has a different expectation. So I kind of set that aside. I actually had a mentee a while back who was going to set up a small scale REIT and develop his own real estate investment trust, uh, which was a way that he could get friends and families and uh, business associates involved in real estate development that he would run and manage. Uh, certainly, you know, a little bit more advanced strategy and something that, you know, when you do have more properties under your management and you're doing bigger deals may be an option. Uh, but the most relevant, and I think the one that we should focus on, is really owner or seller financing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a lot more common than people think. 
it's also one that a lot of times novice investors don't think about. We, we always think about, you know, what can we do with a bank? What does the FHA offer? Are there SBA loan packages if it's commercial? Uh, what does PIDC have, you know, uh, as far as different offers? Is there a first time homeowner, homeowners, uh, you know, uh, offer out there? And the last one we, we generally think about is asking the owner of the property, hey, would you finance this property? I would like to buy it. And, uh, you know, quite often you're able to develop not only very favorable terms, uh, but you're able to, you know, execute the deal. It's a lot easier. I mean, I, in fact, last week I applied for a commercial loan. The bank asked me for 52 pieces of documentation from tax returns all the way down. I'm not sure, I, I, had, I didn't read the full email, it was so daunting, but I think my shoe size may have been involved as well. So uh, this, this is the one thing you're able to avoid with, with owner financing. It's much easier, it's much faster. And uh, if you don't have either strong credit, any credit or even poor credit, it's a way for you to get into the real estate business without the scrutiny that a bank or finance company is going to show. Great. Great. Yeah. Thanks, John. That was a great way to set us up. And, and we're going to dig into a lot of the things you mentioned there, like including the friends and family financing. And uh, maybe we can briefly talk about that advanced strategy of a real estate investment trust that you, you mentioned. But uh, before we get into that, I think it's important to, to um, paint the picture of what what this is an alternative to. Uh, you hear alternative financing strategies. What what is an alternative to? You know, what are the traditional methods that you're you're uh, subverting by by choosing some of these? I mean, you're talking banks, credit unions, any traditional lender. Uh, it you know it could be the FHA. Those are usually administered by banks and other organizations. But you know, these are you know your your traditional banks and so forth are gonna require a lot of documentation. And what I've found you know, in this COVID environment, I don't know whether it's my imagination, but it seems like they're, they're asking for more documentation and more proof of your ability to repay the loans. Mm -hmm. So you know, working directly with the owner, you're able to circumvent a lot of that. You know, uh, private individuals aren't gonna go through the, you know, the rigorous credit checks uh, you know, background checks, you know, financial checks uh, that, that your traditional banks are going to look for. Mm -hmm. and so, so what sorts of, other than, you know, not being, uh, or not being super attracted to the amount of paperwork involved, like what, what sorts of things can limit one's ability to use um, like traditional lenders, like, like a bank or a lending group? Well, I think one of the things that a lot of our, our uh, people that come through Jumpstart Germantown, we're looking for those opportunities. Oftentimes those are, you know, the eyesore properties in a, in a community. Those are the properties that we can buy at a discount that have room to uh, allow you to go in and make the necessary repairs and still have the property appraised and provide you a profit. So, you know, if you find that profit or that property and it's not in terrific shape, well, it's probably also not a very financeable property or a property that a bank wants to necessarily get involved in. Now, yes, they may with a very experienced investor and an investor with a, with a track history and uh, you know financial statements and so forth that the bank has confidence in. But you know, oftentimes if a, if a, a, a novice investor shows up at a bank with a property that is in very poor condition, the bank is gonna put a lot of conditions on that property being upgraded before they'll even grant the loan. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. there's a number of tools and, and you know, as, as you become more sophisticated as an investor, yes, you can go to the bank and get, you know, appraisals as completed and banks will loan against the finished value, but, they only do that if they know who you are, you know, have the, you have the experience and most of all, you have the assets to back up right. what you're trying right. to do. So this is a great tool. I bought my first property. It was a, it was a 16 unit property mm -hmm. at age 21. And I had never purchased anything in my life on credit. Mm -hmm. Never purchased a car, 
the only the only credit I ever had was, was college loans, mm -hmm. and I hadn't started repaying those, so I can't even say I had a good track record <laughs> at that point. Yeah. So, uh, but yes, uh, it, when when a property is in poor condition or as in is condition, oftentimes a property owner is stuck with it. You know, they 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 can't go through a traditional sale where a bank's going to come in, appraise it, and give somebody a mortgage. It has to go to an investor. It has to go to someone that's going to rehab the property. So, you know, when you find those properties that are in poor condition or as is condition, that's a motivator for the owner. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, also, if you find an owner, even if the property is not in horrible condition, I'm actually helping a college professor who is retired, but does not have a great income. He is trying to buy a condominium in Conshohocken mm -hmm. and he's not in great financial shape and he's not working and, and so forth. And the only way we can make it work because he will not get approved by a loan from a bank is we've gone to the property owner and asked if he would hold the mortgage and allow this professor to buy the property. In this case, the property owner has a lot of real estate and he happens to care for this individual who's rented from him for seven years. So he's indicated that he is willing to provide the mortgage and allow this professor to buy the property. But he's an individual who doesn't need the cash. Right. However, since he's a sophisticated investor and a high income individual, he also did not want a large capital gain by selling the property. So believe it or not, by providing the property uh, and financing the property, which is then called an installment sale. Mm -hmm. You know, you could sell a property for a million dollars. If you sell it for a million dollars and you walk out of settlement and that's transacted in a million dollars, that's the number that your, cap your, your capital gains are going to be calculated on. Mm -hmm. If you do an installment sale and you grant somebody a mortgage for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, your taxation is spread out for the life of that mortgage. Mm -hmm. Right. So for a high, a high net worth individual or actually a high income individual that owns real estate, it can be a good tool for them as well. Sure. So, so before we, we get too deep into, I mean, obviously one of the major things we're going to talk about in a little bit is owner financing where we can really get into the nitty gritty of it. Um, but, but, but let's take a step back. And before we even start to look at alternative financing strategies, like how can people identify them and, and find them and how can they, they get to a position where they know people who, who they can work with um, to develop these alternative finances? Um, but I, I know one thing we talked about in our follow or our pre-session call was the importance of networking and, and how difficult it is to network these days. Um, so can you just talk a little bit more about that and, and tell me, you know, what, what are some ways that you think people should really focus on, on networking and, and how can they do that? Look, sourcing properties, uh, contractors, and so much. And, and this is why Ger Jumpstown Germantown is so critical. And the people that I have been extremely fortunate to mentor for the one thing I try to impress on everybody, and I try to bring all of my groups from four and five years ago up and meet the current groups, is the education you get at Jumpstart Germantown is, is spectacular. I mean, it's, it's a lot of people go to school and study real estate to understand what you come out of Jumpstart Germantown with educationally. Mm -hmm. To me, one of the most and maybe the most important thing you should come out of Jumpstart Germantown with, and unfortunately, this virtual environment that we're in does not foster this as well as in person, is the network that you create. The network of your peers who are doing things that you're trying to do. Uh, and, and most importantly, you've got the mentors, you've got Ken, you've got so many people that, that Jumpstart Germantown brings to the table from bankers to uh, construction consultants and so forth. And that network, I mean, anybody who's not getting business cards and following up with an email and, and touching base with somebody that you know, can possibly help them on their deal is missing the point of Jumpstart Germantown. It, the education is great, but the network that you create among professionals and peers is something you'll carry for the rest of the time you invest in real estate. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Um, and, and yeah, like, like you said, John, in the virtual environments, it's, it's entirely <laughs> impossible to like have those pre and post meeting, meeting uh, chats and, and connections. Um, but thank you to everybody who's joining this call, because this is the like a, a bare minimum effort that you can have to, to network. And like you said, attain some of that education. Um, so so and, and continuing or, or post graduation of a training program or, or post joining these jump webinars, connecting with mentors like yourself, John, right? And, and, and meeting people who, who have gone through the whole process and, and aren't necessarily at the same stage as you, but are, are ready to share some knowledge, right? Yeah. Hey, I still, believe it or not, have, have close contact with a number of mentees that I had said go back three and four years. Mm -hmm. And now I tell them they're mentors. So I introduce them to all my new mentees yeah. and, and let them do a little mentoring right? <laughs> and you know, talk about their deals. Well, what did you do? What, was your, what did your first deal look like? How did it work? What would you have done differently? Man, you know, I can't remember my first deal. It was so long ago, uh, you know, where, whereas someone who's done it in the past few years can, can really provide some fantastic input. So uh, I highly, highly recommend that everybody uh, really, really take advantage of the network that this has connected you to. Awesome. So, so moving on, and uh, this is something you mentioned earlier uh, in your in your little intro. There um, was friends and fam excuse me, friends and family financing, um, which is maybe the most popular, the most obvious way to to finance your project, um, other than a bank. So, so tell me a little bit how that that process works, and 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 what things to look out for, and you know, I'm sure there's risks and, and other things involved, and, and ways to avoid that. But but let me start by just saying like what the typical um, friends and family finance looks like. Well, I, I would say there's no typical look. You know, the, the ideal is the rich uncle who will give you the money and never ask any questions and say, you know, let me know in a few years when you sell it, you can pay me back. There you go. Unfortunately, we don't have many rich uncles. I certainly didn't have one. And, and I'd say most of the mentors in the program didn't have one. And if anybody out there has one and you're not using them, please give them my number. <laughs> I'll, you I'll, go. <laughs> I'll do a deal with them. There you uh, go. Most friends and family, uh, you know, often it's it's uh, maybe a, a parent and a child, a sister, brother, you know, or siblings. Quite often it's uh, a friendship. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard, I'll put up the money and they'll put up the work. Mm -hmm. And that's a terrific plan. And the only thing I suggest to anyone that gets involved in friends and family, handshakes don't work, mm -hmm. okay? You need a very specific document, whether you wanna call it an operating agreement, to know what the value is of each partner's input. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the value of the money that goes into the deal and what's the value of the work if one partner is, is putting up the work. And if that's not clearly delineated, I guarantee you at some point in the project, someone's going to think what they put up is more valuable than the other. And that's when, uh, unfortunately, the wheels come off of quite a few deals. When, when, you, when you see a, uh, a project and it makes great progress and all of a sudden you see it stall and nothing happened, you know, quite often you can point to some sort of a dispute among the friends and family that are doing that deal. Mm -hmm. So if anybody gets involved in that, it can be terrific, especially if it's someone who wants to really just put up the money and be silent, that's great. But if you have two active members, define your responsibilities, define your roles and put a value on what those are and, and literally quantify Mm -hmm. whether it's hours or dollars or whatever, that they're going to contribute to the deal. If it's not done, I guarantee you at some point, someone's going to think that what they have prov provided has greater value than the other participants. Sure. So, so other than a, a disagreement of, uh, like you said, value of the deal and, and what the equity between the two members, like what are some other risks? I mean, I'm sure there's, one where somebody could just drop off the face of the earth or, or worse, get injured or, or ill. And, and that, that can make the deal go sour too, right? Oh, look, there, there's all sorts of just natural things that could happen, whether it's injuries or, 
you know, illness, whatever that can, can derail a partnership and, and, uh, or a friends and family deal. Ultimately, your, any deal that you have should be able to stand on its own without having, you know, well, in, in the event that one person were to go away. I mean, let's just say you had, let's say, financier and, a, and the other participant is a contractor. Well, if that contractor, for whatever reason, could not complete the project for illness, disability, or whatever, the project has to still be able to work if you bring in outside contractors right. to finish the project. Right. If the numbers only work with someone putting up all their labor free, then the deal probably Right. You know, it's not a deal you should be doing. You know, the one thing that, that you know, Jumpstart Germantown teaches you is when you buy, estimating and properly estimating your renovation costs and making sure the spread at the end of the deal is sufficient to make the deal worthwhile. And, and if, it, if it works right, yes, you do the deal. If it works wrong, then no, your, your, your Jumpstart Germantown is not going to back you. Right. So, you know, you've got to take the same philosophy if you're if you're doing this with alternative financing, whether it's friends and family or an you know owner seller backed financing. Right, and, and those sorts of contingencies, like you said, like considering the person who was supposed to do all the the labor, you know, get, breaks their leg, can't do any of it, and they they can't give up that free um, that free work. Is that sort of thing outlined in the documents that the, the two parties are signing? Uh, like, like how, I mean, you said an operating agreement is what it may be called. Um, but like, how detailed do you think that contract should be? <laughs> like how, uh, you know, <laughs> what I've found often is they need to be as, they, they, they need to be very detailed. And oftentimes if there's a dispute, I guarantee you, they'll never be detailed enough. Right. But you know, let's just say there's a particular deal and the, the person who was putting up the labor was going to put up the equivalent of $20,000 in labor mm -hmm. as, as their contribution. Let's just say they're disabled and an outside contractor has to come in and their cost is $15,000. Well, there should be an offset. And if there's a specific number in there that that, that working partner was putting up $20,000 in labor and you have to go outside for 15, well, then there should be a clear, you know, uh, document that indicates that that would represent an offset to their return. Sure. So is that something that, that you think is absolutely required that a lawyer uh, drafts up or is that something that two people can do independently from lawyers? Look, I mean, if, if, if people have experience in, in agreements and so forth, you know, certainly they can draw up the agreement between themselves. Uh, it, would, it would be great to have an attorney or somebody take a look at it and make sure there's enough uh, uh, peer two fours and their fours in there, which uh, these days cost about $500 per hour. But uh, it's probably good to make sure that it's structured so that it's, it's legally sound. But I think the individuals between themselves can develop a, an agreement from a financial point of view as to what the contributions are gonna be. And if they can frame that up, you know, an attorney in, in pretty simple order can actually put that into a form that's enforceable. If you're just tuning in, this is a conversation with John Thame, who is a Jumpstart Germantown mentor and experienced real estate developer going on 40 years about the alternative financing strategies you have for your projects and the option of owner-seller financing. Thanks for listening to the Jumpstart Philly Real Estate Radio Show on Germantown Community Radio, WRGU 92.9 FM. I hope you're enjoying the discussion. Jumping back into the, the conversation, I want to um, touch on something that, that you mentioned earlier, which was um, an individual... I think you said it might have been a mentor or a mentee of yours had had set up a real estate investment trust um, after they had kind of grown out of that friends and family financing. Um, we don't have to go too deep on, on this, but I think it is uh, certainly a valuable option for people who might see that as, as something they can do. Um, what did that look like? And, and what are the advantages of having one of these REITs? Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, these are, these are, these are complicated. Uh, it, it's not an easy document, but, you know, again, there's attorneys out there that, 
are familiar with this that could draw one up. You know, <clears throat> scale is going to be one of the important things of, of a REIT. I mean, you know, if you're doing a duplex for $225,000, you know, you, you don't have the scale really to, uh, to, to go through all the paperwork that you needed. This is going to be when you're doing a larger deal or a larger uh, maybe group of houses or a larger apartment building, you know, where you do, do need to raise a large amount of capital. And, uh, you know, the individual that I spoke to actually set up a REIT and the attorney that drew up the paperwork, rather than him pay the attorney, he actually gave him a percentage interest in the REIT. There you go. Which was, you know, uh, one of the things, you know, we, we, we could also, instead of calling this alternative financing, we could also call this creative financing because mm -hmm. here he took an opportunity, probably took $5,000 worth of legal fees mm -hmm. and converted that into a percentage ownership in the trust. Right. Right. So I guess with, without the, the sort of industry standard boundaries that you have to work within with like traditional lenders, you can kind of come up with these, these solutions that, that make things order easier in the short term. huh? Exactly. And, you know, uh, you know, with, with, with something like this and, and by the way, no one, if they've never done a deal, should be thinking about how do I set up a, a you know, a real estate investment right. trust. Right, right. You know, this is when you've done six, seven properties and you're going for that, uh, $2 million apartment building or, you know, uh, development project, that's where you probably think about it. And, and, if that, and it, it, I just want to tell everybody in the call, if that's something that you, you think specific or applies to your situation, you know, you can get in contact with John and maybe he can give you a little bit more of a, a detailed explanation of it. Um, but absolutely. And it's a former mentee. And I'm, you know, uh, I, I mentioned to him that we were going to be on tonight and he said, you know, for the future, as this develops, he would be glad to share any information that, uh, uh, you know, he's learned through the process. Cool. So we'll be sure to, to share uh, John's contact information and we can try and make that connection if it's uh, applicable. But, but let's move on to, to what I call the key topic of tonight, which will be the owner financing and, and breaking that down and, and getting into the, uh, the, the nuances of it. Um, I know you already said it earlier, but maybe you could just restate what is owner, owner financing and, and what does it look like? I mean, it's literally when the owner of the property, you know, is willing to loan you the money. They don't actually give you the money, but <clears throat> let's take an example. An individual inherits a house in Germantown and they, they have no desire to live in it. You know, they had an elderly parent there. It needs a lot of help, you know, a lot of work if they were to put it on the market. And you approach that person and say, I will buy the house as is. Mm -hmm. Now, again, if that person is in a... Sorry, John, just for people who might not know, what does as is mean and what, what implications does that have? It means if, if the, you know, it doesn't mean you don't get a home inspection, by the way, because <laughs> you got to know exactly what as is is. Right. But let's just say it needs a roof. It hasn't been painted for quite a while. It's got an old kitchen. Maybe it has some things that are, you know, not up to current code, like knob and tube wiring, things like that. And believe me, you see a lot of this in Germantown because they're older homes. So, and you know, the house could have been say neglected for a while, had some roof damage that wasn't repaired right away. So you've got, you know, some floors that are warped or buckled or whatever. So, you know, the individual who inherits that house or owned the house, you know, all of a sudden they're looking at, geez, do I want to put a lot of money in this to bring it up to standards to sell it, you know, traditionally, or do I want to sell it as is? And right. if they sell it as is, yep, there's a lot of people that will come up and, you know, pay cash. You would probably have a group of the mentors for the right property that are going to go in and pay cash and renovate that house and, and either flip it or rent it or, you know, uh, some way or another uh, uh, use that property. If you find that property, though, as a, as a first-time buyer or somebody who's not done a lot of deals, the advantages that, that you can give to the, the seller are they can sell it in as-is condition, okay? They can close the deal quickly. 
They're not going to be scrutinized or forced to make a lot of repairs and so forth like they may be in a traditional uh, a sale. Uh, they're going to have lower costs. And most important, if it's a higher income individual that inherited this or owns this and has just moved on, they can spread their taxation out over the length of the mortgage, whether it's 10, 20, 30. And I recommend going for the longest mortgage you can get. So, you know, if they were to sell the property, you know, for on a cash deal with a tradition with traditional financing, they're taking that entire capital gain immediately. Right. When they give you the mortgage, that becomes what's known as an installment sale. Installment sale, the 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 capital gain on that transaction would be spread out over the life of the loan. Mm-hmm. So let's say if it's a 30 year loan, let's just say someone made 300,000 on the property. If they sell it traditionally, they've got a $300,000 gain, mm-hmm. assuming you know, it's 100% exposed. Mm-hmm. If they give somebody a 30 year mortgage, well, it's now 300,000 divided by 30. Mm-hmm. So they're only picking up, if I, my math is correct, 10,000 per year in income or in capital gain. Of course, there's gonna be interest and so forth expense that they'll pick up as well. Uh, but you know, that's, that's a big advantage to someone who doesn't wanna you know, get hit with a big tax bill right away. Yeah, totally. Um, and and or I'll, I'll let you keep going, I, I wanna- well, yeah. and, and the other thing is if somebody has inherited this or say they, they, they bought it and they moved and maybe they rented it for years, but they don't want the aggravation of, of renting anymore, you know, for people that own property that don't particularly want to manage it or they don't want to own it anymore, a lot of times you make their lives just a lot simpler by taking it off their hands. And if you give them you know, a reasonable price, an easy transaction, monthly income, and you know, without tremendous tax consequences, believe it or not, you're doing them a favor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so- in, in um, you know, continuing with that, what what recommendations do you have for people like that will help them like kind of like sell that idea to to the owner? You know, you, you, <laughs> it's it's possible that they might not know that this was an option. You know, they never really thought of that. Like, how how can you portray it as a as a profitable solution and, and an easy solution? Well, you know, and, and you you come on come along a good point. You know, there's a lot of buyers that don't know this exists. There's a lot of sellers that don't know. Yeah. Right that they have this. So, you know, as an option, it's very important that you understand what the, you know, what your goals are, obviously, but what the seller's goals are. And, and obviously you've got to put together a, a proposition that makes sense to the owner and seller of that property. And you've got to literally be able to sell them on the advantages of the deal. And, you know, if I'm speaking to that seller, I'm going to say, look, I can make this very easy for you. We can close this deal quickly. I'll take the property as is. You can defer your capital gains. You're going to get a monthly income. If you want and you don't want to be stuck in this forever, we can put a balloon payment on this where I will pay off the loan in five years or seven years. The mortgage will be secured by the property. So if I ever failed at what I did, you'll get the property back. So it's not like it's going to go away and, and you know you have no security on this. I'm going to make your life easier because you no longer have to manage this property. And then believe it or not, you got to sell yourself. Mm-hmm. I'm young. I'm hungry. This is something I want to do. I've got the resources to do it. Mm-hmm. I've got the desire to do it. And I've got the time to do it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, believe it or not, there's some people out there that are, that are going to admire the fact that you're willing to undertake a project like this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so 
you know, is owner financing or, or seller financing, is it common? Is, I mean, you said m- many people don't know about it, but, you know, how often do you think it really takes place? And is it difficult? Is it easy? Um, you know, like you said, people, there's a there's an education gap between people who know about it and the people who use it. Um, so, like, what 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 is the, the truth about, you know, like it's, it's usability or, or it's success? You know, I, I, I don't I can't quote a statistic on how frequently it's used. Uh, you know, I would say it's it's used more frequently than most people think. I know I've used it five or six times uh, in my career. Uh, like I said, I'm working with a with a college professor at this point who does not have a great income or retirement that the owner of his property is is willing to consider it. So you don't know unless you ask. Now, here's the other side to that. And it's, it's a, a part of the of, of getting owner financing is identifying properties mm-hmm. that lend themselves or, you know, are appropriate for owner financing. You know, if a property is in tough shape, it's, a, it's part of an estate that and it's gone neglected for a long time. Uh, you know, possibly if it's if it's an older person that's going into, uh, you know, a smaller, you know, they don't need a large house, they're downsizing or they're going into assisted living. Uh, there, there's any number of options. So I think you have to I, kind of identify who's a candidate for this. Uh, I, get, I can tell you right now, if, if you're buying, say, a, you know, a starter home in an area where people generally start, and then they sell that home and move up as their families grow and so forth. That's not a candidate. That person needs to cash out and, and take their equity and put it into their next uh, larger home mm-hmm. as their family grows. So you got you to have to understand who the candidates are for this. Um, you can usually preliminary, pr- preliminarily make an identification from the exterior of the property. If it's beat up and fallen down and overgrown and so forth, there's, you've got a disinterested owner for whatever reason. And, so, oh, go ahead, John. Sorry. No, and the other thing is, you know, again, this gets back to the network, you know, uh, and, and just keeping your ear to the ground, you know, um, if, if so-and-so is, is downsizing or the person, you know, in that house. And, and guess what? It's not ridiculous to identify a house and walk up and down the street and ask neighbors what the hell's going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so um, and, and as we start to close up here, cause we'll move into Q and A in just four or five minutes. Um, th- tell me a little bit, you know, you said uh, there's obvious advantages um, financially like tax breaks and, and, you know, it's a, it's a, a, a guaranteed uh, a buyer. <laughs> um, but, but tell me a little bit more about the documentation benefits and like the, the ease of use, you know, Obviously, it can't be as simple as word of mouth. There has to be some some legal paperwork or, or document. Oh, I, look, you're, you're still going to put together a formal purchase agreement. Right. Uh, yeah. You're going to draw up a mortgage. Now, with the costs, you know, believe it or not, when you go to a bank, you're paying for, for all these transaction costs and fees anyway. So you're going to go to a lawyer and just say, you know, draw up a purchase agreement. Once your purchase agreement's drawn up, mm-hmm whether it's the owner or the, the buyer, somebody's got to draw up a mortgage. Mm-hmm. I mean, it should be the, the, the buyer, or pardon me, the, 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 uh, the seller, but in some cases they may say that they want somebody else's lawyer to do it. I, I would never do that, but, <laughs> but somebody's got to draw up a mortgage. It's a fairly standard document. And then that document's going to be recorded. Mm-hmm. So, you know, all of this is going to be done literally the same as it would be by a bank, except, you know, you're going to have private individuals doing it. You're going to have a private attorneys doing it and there will be legal fees involved in this, but there's legal fees when you deal with a bank too. But the, but the sum of those, you know, fees that you're doing independently would probably be less than what would the bank would be charging, right? I, I, yeah. Cause the bank's going to have a, a, a lot of fees right down to they're charging you for notaries or charging you for FedEx you know, document, they call it document prep. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, it, you know, I think you're going to end up with a comparable or lower fees. Right. This. Right. Uh, I think one thing we should talk about before we move into the question and answer is, 
you know, when you structure the deal, what what sort of deal should you structure? Okay, you get you you get the that that fortunate person who says yes, I'd love to back you. What are the terms that you want? Here's what I'm going to suggest for you. You want the longest amorti amortization you can possibly get, preferably 30 years. Now, some owners may say, no, nah, I'm not going to go more than 20 years or whatever. Uh, but I would, I would press for 30 years. Um, if, if, if you have to give anything, if somebody doesn't want to give you the, the longer term, the way you might be able to convince them to give you the longer term is just by saying that you'd be willing to give them a balloon payment, meaning you would pay the loan off in five years or seven years. Uh, the advantage to that for the seller is with that 30 year amortization, not too much of the principal has been paid down. So if that balloons in five years and you have to put traditional financing on it in five years, well, if they loaned you $200,000, five years from now in a 30-year amortization, mm -hmm. that, that 200000 has only been paid down probably eleven, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. So they will not have only gotten the payments for five years, but now they're going to get a check for $190,000. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a, a big advantage mm -hmm. for a seller. Mm -hmm. And you know something you got to be able to sell. But here are the other terms you want. You want the longest amortization you can possibly get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want a great interest rate, but don't don't push that hard on the interest rate. You know, get the years. The years are lower your 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 your, your payments on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. You know, right now interest rates three, you know, three percent. Well, even for an investor, you're probably talking four four and a quarter. You know, if you have to pay five or six percent, that's still a terrific rate. You know, yeah. and if and you know if you have to trade rate for years, trade the rate for years. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, like I say, use that use that balloon. If you get into this property, you renovate it properly, just like you do in a Jumpstart Germantown deal. You've got five years to get that property to. Uh, back into the condition it needs to be so it's financeable. Mm -hmm. At that point, between the discount that you got the property for, five years of hopefully appreciation, mm -hmm. not to mention the appreciation you get from making the repairs, you can easily refinance that, that property and pay off the original owner financer. Awesome. John, well, that wraps up our, our conversation. And, and I just want to thank you again so much for, for dedicating the time tonight to come and uh, educate our community. Thanks again. Oh, a pleasure. A pleasure. Uh, this is one of the, uh, uh, the great privileges I have is to work with Jumpstart Germantown. So thanks for the opportunity. And I thank Ken and everybody who participates in the program. It's, it's truly one of the great programs that exist not only in Philadelphia, but hopefully it goes throughout the rest of the country. And that concludes my conversation with John Thane, who is a Jumpstart Germantown mentor and experienced real estate developer going on 40 years about the alternative financing strategies for your projects and the option of owner-seller financing. Next week, I'll be speaking with Mariah Levin, who is Philly Office Retail's CFO, about what you need to know about bookkeeping as a beginner in the real estate development world. The interviews on this program are recorded during Jumpstart Germantown's weekly Jumpinar series, which takes place via Zoom webinar every Monday night at 7 p.m. If you'd like to participate in the live Q&A with our guest, be sure to head to jumpstartgermantown.com events and register for next week's Jumpinar. And if you're interested in starting a Jumpstart program in your own community, you can visit gojumpstart.org to see our how-to guide and open source training workbook. Thanks so much for listening to the Jumpstart Philly Real Estate Radio Show on Germantown Community Radio, WRGU 92.9 FM. And be sure to tune in next week.